Hey, Expanded Universe fans and James Bond fans, we had so much to learn from our recent guest expert, Dr. Lisa Funnel, that we just couldn't squeeze it all into that one episode, so we decided to further the conversation here. Amazingly enough, there is a lot to discuss about the James Bond franchise and how it relates to society and gender and the film industry and all that stuff. So grab a vodka martini, shaken not stirred, or a cup of coffee or tea, shaken not stirred if that's more your speed, and enjoy this special Cinema Craptaculous Presents the Expanded Universe bonus episode, a conversation about the Daniel Craig James Bond era with our special guest, Dr. Lisa Funnel. Geek out! It's the Expanded Universe with your host, John H.H. H. Ford. And joining us again on Cinema Craptaculous Presents the Expanded Universe is Dr. Lisa Funnel. Dr. Funnel is an associate professor in the Women's and Gender Studies program at the University of Oklahoma. She is a co-host on the weekly podcast, James Bond and Friends, as well as the host of her own podcast, Licensed to Critique. And she's also an award-winning author and leading expert on gender, feminism, and geopolitics in James Bond and other action films. Dr. Funnel, thank you for coming back and joining us here on the Expanded Universe. Thank you so much for inviting me back. You know, I feel really bad because while we are doing this, the red carpet premiere for No Time to Die is going on on Facebook. Now, did you catch any of that before we started to talk? I didn't. I am part of a group chat with my co-hosts on James Bond and Friends, and they have been sending me pictures of what Daniel Craig is wearing and what other uh, stars are wearing. But I figured I would catch up once it's all done, because it's one of those things that gets drawn out on a red carpet, yeah. and I just I just want the highlights. <laughs> it's, it's, it's spectacular. They pulled out the stops. I won't tell you everything, because if you're going to watch it fresh, it's, there's, it's pretty cool. And uh, I, I've been doing an embargo on a lot of things. You guys are in the spoiler world, so it gets a little tough, but... I, I saw the trailer, the first one last year, or whatever, 2020, whenever it was, once, and then I haven't watched it. But in my social media feed, mm -hmm. I've probably seen the cookies on that Aston Martin or doing the donuts in the town square 80 million times. And they played a bit of the Billie Eilish song on the red carpet. And I immediately had to stop it because I, you know, <laughs> I did that the last two films where I, I didn't see anything. It worked better with Skyfall because I really didn't see anything. And then I saw – uh, the movie with no trailers and the song was fresh and it was wonderful. But you guys can't do that. Well, I have a I had a friend today ask me if I had listened to the soundtrack and read what the all the soundtracks were called, right. like the tracks were called. And I was like, no, like that is a spoiler. It's going to tell me what the emotional tenor is. The the actual titles are going to tell me the content of the film. And so, I mean, I've done my best even when the trailers came out. I was, unless I was doing it for James Bond and Friends, I was not engaging with it because I just wasn't in a place to engage with it. Like, I want to be surprised or as surprised as possible, but I just am not sure what is going to slip through the cracks. And I did tell people on social media to, to please understand that not everybody lives in London. Uh, right. when releases happen, they happen staggered wise. So the U S gets it at a certain point, places in Asia get it. I think Australia is a couple months behind. And there's many of us who really want to have that genuine, surprising, fresh experience in the cinema. It's just going to be very difficult because people are going to want to talk about this film. Totally. Uh, Good idea to avoid like CD soundtracks. I'll, I learned my lesson in 99 with The Phantom Menace when like literally I'm waiting in line to see the movie and uh, my girlfriend at the time bought me the CD and I'm looking through the tracks and it said Qui-Gon's death. And I was like, yep. uh, you know, anytime it's like funeral pyre for, you know, for, you know, anything like that. Like, thanks. Why? Why did I do this? Uh, yep. This time of year, the last two years, there should have been a Bond film. And, and mm. it's really surreal that it's here. And I have just seen social media and the media in general go crazy. And I think part of it is, you know, there's this desire to go get out to the movies a bit, even though it's still, you know, a little scary for many of us. But I think they're really putting that foot forward. And I know you have been quite the sought after source. So I'm lucky to have you. And there's a couple of topics I wanted to talk about that fall into your purview, particularly. Let's uh, talk a little bit about future bond casting because you know mm -hmm. now it, it it's interesting that you know that they're actually they are talking about a little bit uh broccoli just said you know this week or at least it was that they will start talking about casting just not until next year you know it's a little bit of mm -hmm. you know look i just got married my husband is just passed away let me grieve and that's kind of what she's feeling a little mm -hmm. bit with daniel craig and it is the the weird feeling of wow this is the first time where an actor has actually had a had a say in the exit. But I mean, it's a tough job, made even tougher, I think, 
by this expectation and also dread of maybe non-traditional casting. You know, that said, the the current film has Lashana Lynch, who, spoilers for people who don't know, uh, inherits the 007 codename. And then there appears to be an even larger emphasis in this film on Bond's actual relationship this time, as we're seeing, you know, his love interest from the previous film brought back. And Mm -hmm. um, she appears to be more than just a romantic foil. I want to talk about something a fellow professor said in one of these uh, Guardian interviews. Uh, Her name was Dr. Claire Hines. And she said, what Bond looks like and what he stands for are two separate things. Just because you move beyond whiteness doesn't mean you move beyond those other core problematic aspects of Bond, such as the fact that he stands for imperialism and toxic masculinity. There's a strong backward looking aspect to the character that's difficult to reconcile with any forward looking casting decisions. How do you, uh, Dr. Funnel, think they should approach casting of Bond in the next film? Well, first of all, shout out to the amazing Claire Hines, who has done amazing research in the world of James Bond. If you're interested in looking at or reading about um, the relationship between James Bond and Playboy, she wrote a book on it. So she's definitely a leading figure and somebody that I've had the privilege of, of knowing and working with. For me, I think the way that I've answered this has been sort of twofold. On the one hand, responding to Daniel Craig's comment of, you know, should a woman, you know, play the character of James Bond? I think what he's raising is this question of gender swapping as being a diversity practice when it comes to casting. And when we think about James Bond, James Bond has had accusations of being sexist, misogynistic. There's a lot of conversations about sexual violence, particularly in the Sean Connery era. And I'm happy to talk about that if you'd like to talk about that. Um, But this is the history, the legacy, and the luggage of James Bond. And so the question is, should we put a woman in that particular role? Can you divest the character from that baggage? Will the film be anything but a conversation about the change of gender in James Bond? Will the media focus on anything other than the change in gender in the character of James Bond? And so then the character, in my opinion, can't look forward. She could not progress because she's going to be weighted down by the history, the legacy, and the luggage of Bond. It's it's the same sort of line of argument like, can you reclaim terminology and divest it from its history? And it's very difficult to do. And I think when the question comes up, then when it comes to this notion of quote unquote race swapping, right? Um, This idea of casting somebody of a different race, this is where the colonial roots and the legacy of James Bond uh, occurs. You know, there's this long history of, of depicting empire of bond going into different places, different spaces, um, going through colonizing actions by occupying resources, um, uh, utilizing people, just watch Octopussy and Bond operating in India, you know, going through the bazaar and wrecking people's livelihoods, right? And we're supposed to laugh along, but it's like, ooh, that's really problematic. Um, And so there is this long legacy and there is a history of poor representation. Whether you want to talk about Ian Fleming's novel, Live and Let Die, that I cannot read because of his use of slang for black characters, or you look at some of the representations that that we've had in this franchise, the question is, should James Bond, could James Bond be played by a man of color? And can we decolonize the, these images? Is this something that is actually possible? And then I think there's one more layer on top of that. You know, James Bond is not just this sort of British figure. He's not just a part of this sort of Anglo-American franchise. He's a global figure. And so any casting decisions are also going to have to take into consideration the global film market. And I've done a lot of work, for instance, looking at China and Chinese cinema. And there are racial representations specifically for Black people in a lot of Hong Kong films. There's a long history um, when it comes to to Asia and specifically East Asia and cinematic representations. And if you're relying on the East Asian market, are you going to take that, and specifically the China market, are you going to take that into consideration into your casting? Will that play a role? I don't know if it will. I don't know who's making these decisions. But I think there's going to be a lot of factors that come into play. And I think one of the things that needs to be stressed is that James Bond has historically been a character of privilege. 
right? Yeah. And when it comes to sort of Northern Western identity, he's privileged in every significant dominant social category. He's never marginalized for who he is based on his identities. He's judged for the things that he says, the things that he does, and the way that he antagonizes his enemies, right? Yeah. It's based on the it's based on actions and words and not necessarily identities. And I think there's this broader desire that so many of us have. And one reason why we're attracted to this character is that he's not limited. He can do and say things and go places that many of us can't. So he can sleep with a whole bunch of people and never be considered a quote unquote slut. But if I engaged in those actions, I think I would be judged uh, differently, even in you know today's day and age. And so I feel as though there's this broader desire to see in Bond these reflections of ourselves. And I think for me, that's a very interesting idea in question, but I don't know how they're going to, if they're going to shift or pivot in terms of G- these representational qualities qualities. You know, this is a good pivot to sort of my last question I wanted to ask you. Uh, Mm -hmm. I read a tweet that struck me um, as we spend a lot of time analyzing Bond because, well, it's fun. The quote was, it was a tweet, over analyzing films and reading subtext into them that was never intended by the writer and director gives me the absolute shits. Unfortunately, it's becoming more and more common these days with too many self-described Film historians, in quotes. And and it made me laugh because, you know, you brought up the word luggage and baggage. And, well, two questions. Do you think we're overanalyzing the Bond films now? And, of course, we kind of all are reveling in it because it's kind of like what we're – it's the content we're putting out. But is it possible because there's so many films in the rearview mirror now to just do a film – in the present. I mean, is that luggage, that baggage too much weight? Because look at the Sherlock Holmes character, um, not done by the same people. So you can't really compare it to the Bond franchise. But, you know, they've modernized it pretty well. I mean, if you look back to like the, the literary roots and the Basil Rathbone era um, compared to the more recent incarnations with, you know, Johnny Lee Miller and, and uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, it's very modernized. You're not you're not really thinking about like the whatever social mores of the originals, but the Bond films are all in these dominoes in a row. So can we kind of possibly let go of it and start fresh or is it, is it a a non-starter? I think it's interesting when people say that they don't want to see texts overanalyzed. And I think what gets overlooked is the fact that media and specifically popular media, it impacts us. These are not texts that happen in a vacuum. We watch these films We take in the messages. Um, Now, you can look at Stuart Hall, and Stuart Hall has, you know, the three ways that we can engage with media. We can accept the dominant message, we can reject the dominant message, and we can negotiate our own messages. I mean, there's a whole bunch of cultural theorists talking about the way that we connect with, with media and texts. But at the end of the day, we emulate these characters. We perform. We repeat their their lines. I can t- I can name at least a dozen people that I know that the first drink that they got when they turned legal age to drink was a martini dry shake and not stirred. Right. right? So we don't simply watch at a distance. Right. We are consuming. We are engaging, and we might not even be conscious that we're taking in these messages. Right. Um, and so I think it's. I think saying I don't want people to overanalyze is a way of putting up a barrier of not wanting to engage in that work of of critical thinking about the media and the messages there. I've always said you can like a text and you can critique a text and both things can be true. You don't have to simply accept everything blindly because you like something and you don't have to reject something entirely because you don't like an aspect. I really believe I really believe in a middle ground. I don't believe in binaries. I don't believe in political binaries. I don't believe in gender binaries, right? And in a black and white photo, there's a lot of shades of gray and most people, not 50, uh, but there's a lot of people who exist in in these shades of gray. And so as somebody who teaches a course on body image and we talk about media messages, media messages matter. Media messages impact the way that we see ourselves, engage with other people, and engage with the world at large. So, I mean, I definitely push back on people who are saying, don't do this. I I see it as a protective mechanism for them, but there's value in doing what we do because at the end of the day, yes, we might go to our jobs, but we come home and we spend hours Think about the last time you binged watch a show. How many hours of content did you just take in? You made that choice. You made that choice to sit there for 15, 20 hours and consuming it in. Clearly, you're taking in messages in the process. You have this, 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 uh, even your podcast is all about, you know, superheroes and 
How many texts are there? How well do you have to know those texts in order to be able to talk about them? I listen to my friends talking about The Office and I hear them talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They know lines and dialogues and they throw it out as if it's general history. So we're, we're, we're engaging with these texts, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not. And it's really important for those of us who are studying popular media to have some courage to put ourselves out there because it takes a lot of courage. I get a lot of bad messages sent to me telling me, you know nothing. And I'm like, I think I do. Um, Like going out there and, and talking about like media literacy education. Hey, we'll be right back. Hey, this is Dave. We recognize that systematic racism exists, and one of the best ways to overcome it is by amplifying the voices that need to be heard. To continue that mission, every month we'll share a podcast or charity to support. This month, we're supporting the Black Fairy Godmother Foundation, whose mission is to restore black and brown families' stability by removing the barriers that keep them in abject poverty in domestic violence situations. You can find more information and donate at blackfairygodmother.org. And now back to the show. This idea of can we move forward? Can we move forward? I... Can we forget the rapey bonds? Can we forget the horrible racial stereotypes of, you know, or because it doesn't just apply to the Bond films. It's applied to any right. films because, I mean, you know, it, it, people people are losing their livelihoods because of projects they did. Not just things they said, yeah. but like you were a part of that that icky franchise or you did right. that film. And I personally think that we're forgetting the lens in which it was created. We right. so want to go back and make everybody in the past think like us, behave like us and treat everybody else like we think they should be treated. And you weren't in their shoes. You weren't in the shoes of the people mistreated and the ones doing the mistreating to really understand that world. Mm-hmm. It's captured on film or in a song or in a book. And you, to your point, it should be scrutinized. But right. to just constantly judge it through the modern sensibilities um, is, is mm-hmm. futile because it's already been done. It's already been put on celluloid and appreciated or failed back in the day. But with Bond is unique because people buy this collection. And I right. do find it interesting to sort of defend yourself a little bit now as a Bond fan because mm-hmm. it's not enough just to say like, well, I'm a fan of, you know, the finer points of living and fine caviar and <laughs> fine clothes, which nobody really can afford. But are you having to defend this legacy? And what I love about the podcast that you do with uh, the James Bond and Friends is, um, and particularly your perspective, is you come in as a fan, and mm-hmm. and but you don't shy away from the warts. And everything I've read and listened to you, uh, Dr. Funnel, you do what you just said. You balance liking something and taking off the gloves and analyzing it. And I think that's probably maybe a a good message maybe for especially younger people who Mm -hmm. there's a lot to look back on from my generation and go, ick, (laughs) you know? Right. And I think, I mean, I've had a lot of people say who, who want to listen to my podcast and hear my point of view because they're in that position of like, how do I talk about something that I love, but acknowledge some of the problems that are there? And, and I feel like like that's why I'm here, right? To show that this balance can happen because you add with me an extra layer that I'm a woman and this idea that I'm not supposed to like James Bond, right? Like there's a lot of judgment in there. And then there's a I'm lot sure. of like academic judgment. Like, why are you studying James Bond? Like there's a lot of weight on my shoulders. And I mean, I'm a very... Uh, broad-shouldered type of person. Like, I just don't care what people have to say. I'm going to do what I do, but I'm going to do it well. Um, I think that when it comes to, this is this is a question of like history and cancel culture for me. When it comes to say sexual violence, look, I will talk about sexual violence in, in, in the Sean Connery era and I can critique it. And I will tell you, look, is it there? Yes. Is it a product of the time? Yes. Was it ever okay? No. But what do I do with that? Do I say, well, then screw James Bond, put him back and let's walk away? No, I say, let's critique the past. Let's learn from our history and then pivot forward and push for better representation moving forward. And I feel as though this idea of just canceling out things that we don't like means that we're trying to erase parts of our history. We're refusing to actually engage with them, right? Why are we uncomfortable? And discomfort to me is a process that shows that we're engaging in unlearning or learning new things, right? I don't shy away from that discomfort. And as someone like, I teach a course on social justice, right? I teach my students about how to just sit in their discomfort, right? To analyze what it means and then to make conscious choices about how to change their ideas or behavior. I teach a course called Social Justice and Social Change. Change matters. And so I approach this really from a social justice lens of let us talk about the past. Let's learn from it. When people say, I think nothing's wrong with Bond sexually harassing Patricia Fearing, I'm like, Okay, 
but we need to talk about why this is problematic. We need to talk about the harassment of nurses. We need to talk about sexual violence and what it feels like to be a survivor of sexual violence. Then we need to look at the scene and say, wow, this is really problematic. It's played off as a joke. And then what messages did that send so many people about courtship that no doesn't mean no? These are really problematic ideas. We're shifting into a new phase where we're talking about affirmative consent. We're looking at the Me Too movement, bringing so many people publicly saying, that happened to me too. Like, Literally, millions of women are like, this is this is a lived experience for us. And so I take all that information and then I push it on the creators and say, we need to do better. We need to shift forward, pivot forward. And for me, I don't think sexual violence should be used as a narrative trope. I don't think sexual violence should be a motivation for a character becoming strong. Sexual violence changes you as a human being and you carry that trauma with you for the rest of your life, right? And so I don't think this should be this casual narrative trope that we utilize. Instead, I think we could have better and different motivations for characters. I think it's too easily used, but it's also sending out really harmful and problematic messages. So I'm not a fan of just canceling things out because they make us feel uncomfortable. I, I totally disagree with that as an approach, but we need to have thoughtful, empathetic, um, constructive conversations, not just yell. Look, if we just yell at each other, we get nowhere. Again, that, that's that middle ground gray area. This is where what, what I teach my students to do. This is where I want them to be because we're never going to learn and anything. And I mean, you've just moved from the U.S. We're never going to get anywhere as a country in the U.S. if we just stop sitting in our echo chambers and screaming at the wind and instead look at each other, which we don't usually get in social media. You and I are looking at each other recording this, which is awesome. See each other's uh, see the world through each other's eyes, engage empathetically, and then have these conversations, have constructive discourse and move forward. And that's something that I definitely try to do within the Bond fan community is to treat people who are passionate about this series with the respect that they deserve, have these constructive conversations and give them pathway for pathways forward so they can talk about their passion. They can also be able to um, respond to critiques and they can still feel like empowered through that process. Well, I think that's a, a great sentiment to people of and not just bond fans but to film you know media aficionados are maybe a little shy about their their collections and we'll probably end it there and hope that you know we can still pull out our our bond blu-rays in a few years but maybe maybe leave some of the poster artwork uh not necessarily on display you know maybe some of the racy stuff doesn't necessarily hold up well particularly bond in a bathtub with a bunch of uh women bathing him but dr funnel thank you so much for joining us great having you on the show and uh, i'm sure you're as excited as your as all of your colleagues and fans are for the new bond film and to see what daniel craig's last hurrah will be like and what the future holds absolutely i'm sure i'll have a lot to say about it <laughs> Thank you for geeking out with us on the Expanded Universe. If you're enjoying all this geeky, nerdy pop culture stuff, make sure you've subscribed to our show, which is part of the Cinema Craptaculous channel. Available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and more. And while you're there, rate us and write us a review. It helps us get the craptaculous word out. Once you've subscribed, you get all of our weekly shows, which includes B-Sides with Adam, Dave, and Tara, Terror Tunnel with Stephanie and her horror co-hosts, The Expanded Universe with the Geeks, John H.H., Doc, and S'more, Real Debates with Dave, Adam, J.D.H., and some surprise guests, and, of course, our flagship Cinema Craptaculous with Dave, John, and Stephanie. And you can find more fun content at cinemacraptaculous.com and follow us on social media. We're Cinema Craptaculous on Facebook, and on Twitter and Instagram, we're at Craptaculous. So much Craptaculous stuff for you to savor and enjoy. Can you really savor Craptaculous? Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs>